All right. This is Ian Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network, and I'm here with Tabia Lee, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Angelo's good friend, and we're doing a member spotlight, and we're just interested in learning more about her. Very interesting person who's been going through a very interesting experience. So first, uh, how are you feeling, Lee, as we call you? <laughs> I'm doing okay, and just glad to be here with you and in community with the Sacred Inclusion Network, always a, a source of empowerment and encouragement for me. Hey, wonderful. I love that. And we love having you part of the gang every time you pop in. You know, we love all the interesting people that, that we get to interact with. Um, so yeah, so I would like to start at the end or kind of like the current where you are now with your life and then work back to the beginning. So, okay. So you were formerly um, employee of Dianza Community College and actually do you still work there or have you been terminated officially? So as of uh, June 30th, um, I was uh, fully terminated. I, I'm still challenging that. I'm trying to, you know, keep my job and do the work that I just got started doing there. Um, but, you know, the people who've been committed to me not being there since I first got there, um, at this point in time, they've, they've managed to succeed. They couldn't push me out, but they used every means necessary that they had uh, to make sure that you know, they could cut me off at the legs there. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Okay, so it sounds from that that you would say that you uh, unjustly lost your job. Um, and so I would just like to hear, could you explain like what exactly happened from your perspective that led to you being fired? Yes, um, so, you know, almost immediately when I started at De Anza Inn, um, a person came to my office hours and they told me that uh, the position was supposed to be theirs. And they said that uh, they had been working at Deanza for many years. They were a former student. Uh, they were now working with the equity office and that they were a finalist for the position. And they told me that um, I would have a very rough road ahead of me. Uh, they didn't know who I was or what my commitment to equity was, but they had been there doing the work and that, that job should have been theirs. Um, this was during my needs assessment conversations. And so that was like less than two weeks into the role. Um, and from that point on, it literally became uh, this instance where this person, one, one singular person, um, led a campaign basically um, to undermine my leadership, to show that I wasn't fit to lead. Um, and then it got ugly. Um, it, it, it just went from, you know, not just wanting my position and the enviousness of that, um, it turned into attacks on who I was, what I stand for. Um, basically, uh, anything I said was twisted and inverted um, to, make, to make it look uh, like I was doing something negative or that I wasn't an appropriate person who should be in that role. Um, and one of these instances was where that same person who told me I would have the rough ride during a team meeting um, told me that I was white speaking white splaining and I was uh, acting like a white supremacist and right. yes and I had never heard those terms like used about me or about any other teachers that I'd ever worked with you know I've been in this field for uh, many years I say four decades because since I was a student I was teaching <laughs> like that's just how my life but my life trajectory has worked mm -hmm. um and so in that time span at many institutions had never heard people calling each other things like that. And, and me as a racialized black woman, I certainly had never been called a white supremacist my entire life. Yeah. Um, so where I grew up, that term has a meaning of being a white nationalist or a, a KKK member, um, you know, someone who is an avowed um, a white supremacist uh, who who hates people of color and you know um, uh, wants to dominate everything. So to have someone call me that uh, in the scope of my work and especially with what I was doing, which was talking about a Google Doc at that time and how we could collaborate with it, um, I was just I felt like I had felt fallen down a rabbit hole and I truly didn't know what they meant until maybe about a month and a half later when I was I kept going to their presentations. And I saw them putting up this slide 
um, and the slide said white supremacy culture characteristics. And I had never seen that slide, uh, but th at this school, they were holding that up as a, as a framework that they do all their equity work under. Um, and I wish they had exposed that to me and to the public, you know, um, when I was applying, uh, because I, I certainly would have thought, you know, again, if I knew that that was a framework that was in use, uh, I wouldn't, that wouldn't have been a good fit for me. But this was something that, um, that, that wasn't publicized on their websites or anywhere, but being used in every workshop that they were promoting uh, in their discussions and in their relations with each other. Um, and that was to me, one of the most toxic and harmful things. Wow, okay. So yeah, it, it sounds like you were just kind of attacked from the get go. And so I wanna take a small step back and what was the role that you were hired for? And like, what were you trying to accomplish within your role? Yes, so this was a faculty role and I was very intentional on taking that. So I have a doctorate, it's in educational leadership and administration. Um, but I've always approached that topic from a teacher leader perspective. Like I've never wanted to be a dean or a vice president, you know, or those upper echelons of leadership. I've always led from the teacher, uh, from the trenches um, and, you know, a co-leader with my, with my peers. Um, and that's how, and I've always been someone who's like, that's something I take great um, diligence with and that I am just deeply committed to, like, how do I improve myself as a teacher, as an individual each and every year? How do I come back stronger to serve my students even better? And then how do I help my colleagues to, to use those same tools? So I'm not someone who's like a hoarder. I find something out and I like, I'm bringing it to my colleagues and I'm saying like, oh, look at this, you know, we should take a look and, and see if we could do um, this new approach or have we even tried this approach that's been out there for many years, you know, but maybe we just don't have the time with all the paperwork and things we're doing. So that's the kind of stuff like that's, that's how I would interact um, as a co-learner um, and as a, you know, as someone who's learning alongside, never thinking I had the right approach or the silver bullet, like I don't think any of us do. Um, so always like a very inquiry-based uh, approach and, and sharing whatever I learned. So um, you asked me a question, uh, Ian, and I feel like I just I ran off from it. <laughs> no, 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 I love that. Um, what, like, what was, what were you being uh, hired, hired for? for? It was a diversity counselor coordinator? Yes. So the, it was a faculty director for the Office of Equity, Social Justice, and Multicultural Education. Mm -hmm. Primary job duties were to lead an institution-wide transformation around those three topics, equity, social justice, and multicultural education. So that's a pretty big task for a single faculty member to do, but that's what they yeah. were doing. And then also to promote inclusion. So, and, and those two things um, were not defined beyond like a bullet point, you know, in the job description. And then the discussions and conversations that I had uh, during the uh, interview process. So I came to understand better what, what they were meaning by that, because that's, those are broad terms, right? Equity means so many things to people. Social justice, again, another very broad term, not well-defined. Um, different people mean different things by it. And same with multicultural education. So I knew one of my first um, responsibilities in that role was going to be to get in and to get on the ground and start talking to people and understanding what do those things mean to each right, person, right, right. right? What does it mean to each department? Um, how are we stalled? Because I was told that we're stalled and our outcomes have just been the same. You know, like we have a deep commitment to, to these things. Um, we're one of the, uh, what do they call it? Like a front runner uh, of social justice. But, you know, it's like a mission drift kind of situation is how I understood it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and folks are wanting more clarity and they were wanting people to rally around again and, you know, really just um, get that community side of the teaching and learning. And I said, oh, well, that's, you know, what I do. So this seems perfect for me. Um, one of the things they did tell me in the interview process was uh, that the office I would be working for was a little too woke. So whenever I hear these kind of like terms, you know, that are very um, charged with a lot of meaning, especially political meaning, I ask people like, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, yeah, because yeah. To me, I'm no expert, you know, in the etymology of wokeness and all that, but I, kn I know that one person says it and it means something positive. Another person could say it and it can mean a very negative thing in today's climate kind of uh, where mm. we're at. And so they told me that their definition of wokeness was when people would come to our office, the, the equity office. I'm saying our still because I'm 
I'm still, my heart's still there. Yeah. You, they've removed me. Um, but uh, um, I said, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, faculty is accused of being racist. Um, they, the, your office often tells uh, faculty members that the, the practices they're doing are racist, um, that they're not mm. reading the students well, um, and it makes people feel alienated. So I said, oh, okay, it sounds like you guys are doing a lot of calling out here, you know, instead of calling in, which is a more inquiry-based approach. And I said, and I can assure you that, you know, I, by that definition, like I'm, I, I don't identify as woke. I'm trying to bring all different perspectives in um, and, and to talk to each other and see how we can identify points of commonality. So I told them that was my approach and it's dialogue based, you know, um, and that I would be bringing people together, looking to define. Um, and they hired me based on, you know, that information and what I thought was a very transparent um, conversation about what are their needs and pain points. Um, so I knew I would need to kind of rein in some of the things that the office was doing. And when I started to talk to um, the office staff, now I'm no, I'm no one's supervisor, I'm just a, a teacher, right? But I'm, I'm a quote director of the office. Um, so I knew I had to be strategic about how I approached that. And, you know, there would need to be some changes in the way that things were done. But as I mentioned to you, there was an interpersonal thing happening from the, from the gate um, mm -hmm. that really uh, undermined and inhibited that. So things I would normally do, like, you know, how do we uh, come together with an authentic conversation with each other um, and, and really critically reflect on what we've been doing and what we can do to better serve uh, our students and each other. You know, I, I couldn't really lead conversations like that because my leadership was undermined from, from the beginning. And I was working with a supervising dean who didn't want me there, uh, who wanted the person that had been in the office, uh, who she was very familiar with, to be in that position as well. Um, and so it was like a catch-22. You couldn't win for losing in that kind of situation. You have a supervisor who, who doesn't want you there. And then you have a person who, you know, in your three-person office, who, who says, this should be my job. <laughs> so that compounded with all the racist and racial stuff that started to happen, uh, just made it a situation where, where you know, um, even I thought I was pretty skilled with having courageous conversations and, you know, leading sacred dialogues and so forth. All, all of those tools and pedagogies, uh, there was not a readiness in the environment for that kind of approach. We, this was about a tear down. We're going to continue to dismantle and destroy um, the outcome, we don't know. We just that we just have to dismantle these power structures and decenter whiteness was another thing that they often talked to talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were deeply committed to like a very racist and racialized approach. Um, and as I start as I started to uncover that, I said, you know, this isn't what other people are telling me. This is a small group, right? My office and a few people who are like the the strongholds, if you will. Um, but that's not everyone on the campus. You know, there's a broad campus, a lot of part-time folks, a lot of full-time folks. So it was a wide cross-section of other perspectives. And if you're on such an extreme, Ian, it's hard to reach uh, people that aren't on that same extreme or that may be on another extreme or just in the middle. Like yeah. the extremes can't reach, right? And so that's what was happening there. You have these camps and one of the camps who is the majority They've just kind of said, we're just going to let, you know, the, 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 the loudest voices and the people who've positioned themselves on academic Senate, we're just going to let them run off with it and do what they're doing. They're calling it the racial reckoning. We're just going to close our classroom doors. I've actually been told this from people and teach our students. And I'm, I'm not even involved with academic Senate. I don't get involved with your office. I just teach because I don't have time or energy, you know, or bandwidth even for all the rest of the stuff that these people are doing. Um, but that's that's saddening because what's happening is they're actually taking over <laughs> the structures, setting the um, the um, the um, educational master plan. So that's a five year plan for the school. They've put in uh, racialized and racist language into that um, and made racial equity a, a focus of it and not really define what they what they mean by that and how they're going to measure racial equity. So education is always about accountability and measurement. We have people who are putting social justice aims into their equity plans and so forth, but they're not putting, how are they going to measure that? How are you going to measure the effectiveness and be accountable 
to the taxpayers who are funding us at this public school. Ooh, my, and those my. are the kinds of questions, you know, that, that I'm asking because that was my role. It was to, you know, think critically, to encourage questions about, um, you know, are we being truly inclusive? Uh, are we in alignment with the legal scope of our work, which many times they were not. So I would, you know, have to say, oh, <laughs> raise my hand and say, let's consider this, you know, are we running a foul of Title IX or Title VII or, you know, the Civil Rights Act? <laughs> Um, those are things that I that I was supposed to do, and just for doing those things and asking questions, it was it was just flipped and inverted, and all kinds of mean accusations and name calling and just ostracization. Um, me myself being marginalized, um, people jumping to conclusions, uh, never coming. There was a lot of what I call talking about each other, but not talking to each other. Yeah, wow. And, and in that kind of environment what can you do? You know, <laughs> when no one comes to you, right. And it's like, Ian, I heard you say in this meeting, like, it sounded like you were saying this or that. It was, uh, did I hear that correctly? Or did I miss something? No one ever came and did those kind of conversations. Um, Lee, when you said that, you know, um, we should maybe stop and think about giving the affinity groups, voting rights and academic senate, what were you getting at there? Like, what was your motive for that? No one ever came to me and talked to me there was just an assumption and, and it was, she's a right-wing extremist. She's a plan. Oh. Uh, she's a dirty Zionist for bringing certain speakers to the school. Like it just jumped to name calling and, right. and demeaning and dehumanizing uh, instead of ever wanting to understand each other. And I'm all about how do we understand each other and how, to, and you know, and, and if I'm going to try to say someone should lose their job, I'm, I'm going to have talked to that person, gone to their workshops and, and like made a logical, objectively based you know, decision, <laughs> you know, um, this person seems like a danger. Like before I call someone a danger, I'm going to have the reasons why, right. And some evidence to back that up. That never happened. You know, it just, it just went straight to name calling. Um, and, and, um, this person being inappropriate and people just literally standing up and, and honestly defaming <laughs> myself and other people, um, you know, and, and jumping to conclusions about things that, that weren't even grounded in, like uh, things that actually happen. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> wow. It, so it really, it, it sounds like kind of a metaphor for what Western society is dealing with over in general. Like so many of these things that you speak of. And, and I should say that I'm sorry all this happened to you. I know like I, I, I can tell by our conversations that your intentions are pure. And um, I'm, I can only imagine how difficult it is for you to go through this. So but I do want to talk about the fact that so this controversy that you're still dealing with, it made national headlines, right? I, like, I think you you uh, you talked to Tucker Carlson, you talked to Megyn Kelly. And um, so I want to know, one, like, what was that experience? And also, why do you think that your story got to such high levels of the national media? And like, why do you think that so that, that came about, I guess? That has been a surprise for me, um, really, uh, Ian. I was not expecting that. Uh, I never expected to be on any news outlets or media outlets or being on like high level interviews or things of that nature. Um, I've been surprised by the number of people who've written to me, um, not mm. just in California, but like, this is like nationwide. And they're saying K through 12, um, librarians have written to me, uh, civic organization members. And, and, and this is like across you know, the spectrum of, of people in industries. And they say, this kind of stuff is happening in my workplace. Um, I, some teachers have said, I'm tenuredly and this is happening to me right now. I may possibly lose my job because I won't sign a DEI statement. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, things of that nature are definitely going on. Um, it's much wider than I thought it was. And I, I guess that's what the interest was. Now, some of the media, they have an obvious political agenda, right? Um, and I've been very straightforward with everybody from the beginning. Like I reject all labels. I, I don't accept any of them. I'm, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat or a socialist or a communist. You know, like I'm not a left or right winger. I'm not, I'm none of those <laughs> things. And, and, I, and I can't be, um, but some of the media has definitely had a political agenda with bringing me on. You can tell by how they couch or frame the story um, or the questions that they ask. And what I've really 
stuck to and, and done is what I tell my students and teachers do stay with your center, you know, stay with your anchors that are outside of that media machine, um, which really wants to use you to put their message out. That's not that they're so much even interested in your story. It's yeah, that your yeah, story yeah. has some pieces, right? That's going to help them or their corporate overload lords get out the message that they need to get out to keep people divided. And I, that has been the toughest part um, to not succumb to that temptation. It's very easy. You know, someone lobs a question and then next thing you know, you're saying or agreeing some, with something that's not who you are in your heart. That's not right. who your center is. So that's been the biggest challenge is keeping that center, that awareness. Um, some people have been angry. You know, they said, why did you go on that show? Or they're this kind of person or that kind of, and I always say, you know what? that's the problem with us right now. Like that's the chains we have to break free from. Yes. We can't keep saying like, I'm not going to talk to that person because they're this, or I think that they said that, or my newspaper told me they, you know, that they're this part of this movement. I have been open in to talk to any person who wants to talk to me and any outlet who wants to talk to me. Should I, as the individual, be faulted because only certain outlets are wanting to speak to me and shine a light on this? I don't think so. No, no, you know? no, no. So I'm willing, I'll keep talking to whoever wants to talk to me. I'm not afraid to talk to anyone. I don't have any positions that cannot be questioned, um, that cannot withstand comparison. And that's part of the problem at De Anza. I was told that making Venn diagrams where I compare different ideas of race ideologies or where I put uh, different scholars next to each other and their ideas next to each other, I was told that was dangerous. And that was leading people to danger by just presenting information and saying, hey, make up your own mind. Which, which of these ideologies aligns with you? That was wrong to do. And I think that's part of the problem in our society at large right now. Um, we are being told and telling each other, you know, don't look at that. Only look at what we want you to consume. Stay in your quote, you know, lane. Um, and I think our lane is all over. <laughs> this is, you know, our lane is critical thinking, um, being able to examine things and say, yes, that rings true to me or no, it doesn't. And if something rings true to you that doesn't ring true to me, that doesn't mean I need to cancel you and, 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 you know, um, ruin your livelihood and make it so you'll never work again. We're doing that kind of thing to each other right now. That um, that's so dangerous. We can't keep going that way. Pretty soon there will be nobody left to cancel, <laughs> you know? Um, so then what, what do we do? Um, after we dismantle all the power structures, what happens after that? Like, I don't hear a lot of what, what do we leave for the future generations? I'm just hearing a lot of right now, we need to grab this. We need to seize this moment, you know, a lot of self-righteousness. And that's going to get us uh, into some tangles that I don't think that we want to be in. Um, and that's going to lead us to adopt things quickly and hastily without thinking. And then when we look back 10 years from now, we'll be saying, wow, did we let that? We did that? Like, oh, OK. Uh, I was in the moment, you know, on the seem like right. a good idea. We should have thought it through. And not all I'm doing with a lot of my work is let's tap the brakes. You know, let's take a minute and look at each other and talk to each other and hear each other. We don't have to agree, but let's just at least just do that and slow it down <laughs> a bit before we end up over a cliff, you know, uh, because we've accelerated things so quickly without looking around us and seeing what are the cues of the environment telling us as we're doing all these things. And what, what are the children telling us? And, and what are the, what is the earth telling us and the environment? What is <laughs> our world around us telling us as we're, you know, trying to just march through? Um, and, and not take care of with one another as we do that. Yeah, I feel you a thousand percent. And, and I know, so you have a hard de uh, deadline, stop line that we're yeah. at right now. So <laughs> I do, uh, you know, I'm so interested. I would love, I might have to get you back again to talk more because, you know, I would love to learn more about, I uh, went to one of your town halls yeah. and you talked about like your experiences with being a diversity coordinator and inclusion and the things that you're seeing. And it was super interesting. So maybe sometime in the future, we can just kind of dive deeper into that. But yeah. for now, you know, you're at the point where you just got terminated. Uh, you told me you're in a lawsuit. Can mm -hmm. you just wrap up about like, what's that, what's it looking like with the dust? Is it starting to settle? I guess not because you're still in the lawsuit. But like, what's the future looking like? And I do want to mention the fact that you do have a GoFundMe. You have had some support, which is cool. Yeah. 
So I'm going to put that in the description below if you want to support Lee for getting fired, for really just like trying to help her community and help her students. Uh, please do that. But yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you finish. Take us home. Thank you so much for being here. And where are you at right now? What's going on? Yes, uh, a lot of folks interested in collaborating. Uh, the outpouring of support through the GoFundMe has been um, um, amazing. And again, unanticipated. I, I hesitated, Ian, to start one of those. Um, so I was a late cover with even starting that up. Um, but as I looked at the horizons and, you know, my family we lost our health insurance, not mm. just income, you know, all the benefits that go along with it. Um, so I said, you know, I need to just ask for help. Um, and I don't like, I don't like to do that. Uh, but it, it, it just literally, uh, I, I had to. And so I'm thankful uh, for the people who have uh, given help that way. Some people say, you know, like, Lee, I just cannot <laughs> donate, you know, but they've signed petitions. Um, uh, Alums for Campus uh, Fairness has a position. They've gotten over 100 signatures oh, on that. that. So, yes, yes. And, and, and people have been writing to the Board of Trustees. So people have been letter writing. They've been signing petitions. They've given to the GoFundMe. Um, there's an organization, Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. They have been the legal support. You know, um, Some people have criticized them in the media and so forth. Um, but from what I've seen, all they've done is help me as an individual in this situation where I've been attacked for you know, um, academic freedom and, 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 and racist reasons from, from a group of people. Um, so I'm thankful to them as well. Um, you know, and, and just, just all the number of people who I didn't anticipate. And so I have a number of um, um, speaking engagements coming up, workshops. Mm. Yes, organizations have reached out to me and said, hey, Lee, come present here. So I do have my little consultancy going still. Um, so I'm thankful for that. And even going out to some nonprofits and just whoever wants me to speak, you know, if I can make it happen, I make it happen because I just feel like that's what needs to happen. That's what needs to happen right now. We need to keep speaking. Some people tried to silence me and toss me out in the dark. And that what they did was they made my voice larger than I ever yeah, imagined, I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Ooh. So I'm like, wow, what's the universe wants me here in this moment. And I'm just going to be in that moment and, and do what I feel I was born to do, uh, which is to ask questions, whatever the orthodoxy is now, I'm asking questions of it. When things shift in a little few years, you'll see me, whatever the new orthodoxy is, I'm going to be asking some questions. <laughs> that's like my nature. So um, that's just who I am. I got something that's inborn inside of me to ask questions and encourage that. So whenever I'm in an environment where that, where someone tries to tamp down on that or tell you to be quiet, I'm like, oh, we really need to ask some questions, you know, like that's really yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> Oh, no, I apologize. I am a little bit over too, uh, but I, we should, we will be in contact. Uh, through yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta, we gotta do this again and get deeper. I appreciate you so much. Go do what you gotta do. Everyone who's still watching. Thank you so much. Sacred inclusion. Join us. Uh, peace and love to all. And I'll talk to you soon, Lee. All right. Bye for now. Oh.